you know, you can have high standards and strive and be happy and healthy and live a very contented life and be successful. It doesn't have to come, come with insecurity and doubt. Only perfectionism grafts those two together. Okay, welcome back or welcome to the Finding Mastery podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Gervais, by trade and training, a high performance psychologist. And I'm really excited to welcome Thomas Curran to the podcast for this week's conversation. Okay, have you ever felt the overwhelming pressure to be perfect in this imperfect world that we're in? Of course you have. <laughs> and so there's this underlying drive for some of us to excel in every aspect of life, from work to relationships, to your craft, to how you show up in social media, to how you engage in social settings, even with your family. Like this need for perfectionism is pervasive. And Thomas has dedicated his career to understanding the complex and often elusive personality trait of perfectionism. So he's a professor of psychology at the London School of Economics, and Thomas's research delves deep into the roots of perfectionism, exploring how it is developed and its profound impact on overall mental health. He had a very influential TED Talk on perfectionism. It garnered over 3 million views, and his research has reached the pages of esteemed publications like Harvard Business Review, New Scientist, he's been featured on CNN, and a testament to the urgency of this topic in today's society for so many of us. He's also the author of The Perfection Trap. This is a must read. This is for anyone who's seeking a deeper dive into the psychology of perfectionism, who knows the pains of it, is looking for freedom from it, of a more authentic life, a deeper way of living. It's a nice, easy read, evidence-based, research-backed. I think you're going to love it. So in our conversation, Thomas and I explore the depths, the costs of perfectionism. We unravel what it is and what it means and why it's on the rise in our society and the hidden cost it exacts on our well-being. And most importantly, you know how we can work with this pervasive force to find a healthier path to growth and fulfillment and purpose and meaning. And so, yeah, you know, let's embrace our imperfections. It sounds so easy. So I'll, maybe I'll just highlight one of them. My nose is as crooked as a nose can be. <laughs> so um, I'm not trying to hide that from anyone. And so I think it's just a fun way. If there's so much freedom to say, hey, look, I'm not perfect. None of us are. Get over it. I think that you're going to love this conversation. There's some real tools in it. So let's jump right into the conversation with Thomas Curran. Thomas, I'm so happy to have this conversation with you and congrats on your work to date. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks, mate. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Okay, good. So this word perfectionism, it's thrown around all over the place, especially in the world of high performance. And, um, and that's really what this podcast is about, helping people be their best. Mm. What is your working definition of perfectionism? Okay, so perfectionism, you're absolutely right. It's all around us. You hear it all the time. It's the quintessential answer to that difficult interview question. What's your favorite weakness? I'm a bit of a perfectionist. This is what we think is a socially desirable weakness, you know, the one we're so much better for having. Um, but my perspective on perfectionism perhaps is not quite the same as most people's. I am... Um, a researcher in the area, I've done a lot of work uh, looking at what perfectionism means, talking to perfectionistic people. And what I see time and time again is um, a very defensive uh, way of thinking, uh, rooted in deficit, a sense that I'm not enough or I'm not perfect enough, and that everything I do really in the world is to try to demonstrate to other people that I'm okay, that I'm worth something, that I matter. And the way that I can guarantee that I gain their approval and validation is by being perfect. So perfectionism is um, a deficit, a way of deficit thinking, I think, rooted really in shame about the imperfect person that we are and trying to emulate some idealistic uh, ideal that we hold in our minds about the perfect person we think that other people want to see. Uh, and so if we can start there with our understanding of perfectionism from a point of deficit, then you can begin to unpack really why perhaps it's not as positive as we think it is. I just kind of love the honesty of the, the definition and then hearing your child in the background crying, which is so funny, right? Like, <laughs> So sorry. So, no, no, it's like, so how do you, this is a eloquent moment, like how do you manage, of course you want to have a, 
an optimal environment for a conversation like this. And then having um, your child in the back, it doesn't sound like your child is distressed. It sounds like it's like wanting something. How do you personally manage that? Do you know what? It's like taking a sledgehammer to perfectionism. I mean, you have children, you have this kind of, it, it, it breaks down those pressures and need to, to do things perfectly all the time because simply you can't. Like there's no way that you can control everything, you can perfect everything, you can be on time in a certain place all the time. There's always going to be moments where you have to let people down. There's going to be moments where you have to send things out into the world that aren't quite as perhaps ready or perfect as you used to send them out into the world. But you got no choice. You just got to do it because there's only so many hours in a day, right? And this this really is actually quite uh, liberating in some ways that you kind of accept that, okay, it's good enough, it's got to go. It's good enough, it's got to go. I don't have time. I have to, I've got other priorities. And and as I say, I mean, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist person. It's why I do this work. And uh, Wait, wait, wait. wait. Say, say that again, Thomas. You're a what? A perfectionistic person. Uh, oh, you are? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. So that... So I want, that's why I wanted, I wanted to know like why you wanted to study perfectionism and, you know, so that's it. <laughs> well, it's research is me search in this, in this respect for sure. Um, mm. I've definitely struggled with it. Uh, but as I say, you know, as you get older and um, life unfolds a little bit and you accept that things are out of your control. Um, for me, that's, that's helped a lot kind of break down those perfectionist tendencies. And then of course, writing a book on perfectionism and putting that out into the world <laughs> I mean, these things have, have all helped me understand that sometimes things aren't perfect and most things we do are imperfect, but that's okay. You're going to get criticized. People are going to say things that are good. You're going to say things that are bad. But at the end of the day, it's uh, that's the part and parcel of just living in an imperfect world and um, being an imperfect human being. When when we, I brought up to to you that, you know, I was noticing the your child in the background, did that help relieve tension? Or did that heighten the tension? Oh, it's a good question. Well, I, I think when you go on these things uh, and you talk to people and you know it's going to go out into the world, there is a certain baseline expectation that you'd like you know, the content, I suppose you'd say, to be, right? Like that it would it would have, um, we'd have a good conversation. There wouldn't be any distractions uh, and certainly no interference on the audio. So like when you bring that up, because I didn't know that that came through the microphone, it's like, oh, oh no. Uh, is it okay? Is it going to matter? Like, are the producers going to have to edit that out? Uh, like, so there's all these kind of things in my mind that uh, worry about um, whether you know uh, if it's it's going to compromise the overall quality of of, of of our conversation. So a little bit, yeah. Like, there's a little bit of apprehension, but then instantly when when you bring it up and then you, you there's a smile on your face and we're laughing about it that that's almost disarming in some ways it's, oh, it's okay all right it's okay it doesn't it doesn't matter if we're talking about it it's part of the conversation there are going to be times when it's not perfect and that's okay i i find such freedom being forward or vocal about the things that are use your your language imperfect i don't i, I don't it's almost maybe the first time i've ever even said that word i think but when things are messy and they are, you know, um, honest in the presentation. I find it so relieving. And that's why I was wondering how that affected you in that respect. And so, yeah, it's cool to know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, it's, fu it's funny because this is also a new um, environment for me too. Like I, d I don't really do podcasts um, on, of this form. Most of my uh, com communication of my work is through lectures and all the rest of it. And actually, one of the things I found I used to do a lot was worry about what other people think because you, you have this image of a professor in your mind and you know people think that as they're as they're watching you that they're going to be across all the detail they know every you know they know every part of their research and they're the authority and that's a hell of a lot of pressure uh so i used to put myself under so much pressure to make sure i gave flawless performance like every time there was a question and i was answering it comprehensively and then i did something different one time where i admitted that on a research study I didn't, wasn't across the analysis and I made a mistake. And suddenly what was really interesting was the whole of the audience almost took a collective sigh of relief. Like these, these postdocs are the people who thought that this professor was bulletproof, suddenly showed a chink in the armory. There is something quite liberating, I think, when people open up at their vulnerability and are able to uh, show that actually, you know, they don't know everything, that we're, we're all imperfect. Even the professors get things wrong 
from time to time. And uh, I think that's good for people to see and it's good for people to know because at the, in this society, we don't often see that very often, do we? We see flawless performances, the 0.01%, the unicorn achiever. Those are the only people we platform, the only people we listen to. So we get this warped sense of what the expectation is and, and how high the bar is and you know how flawlessly we should perform. And I think that makes us reluctant to show our imperfections, but I think we should do it more. I think that there's something to celebrate about um, the process of growth and like rather than the presentation of excellence. And so there's a value in both. Now you, you've done two things here. So I, as one psychologist, you know, to a trained professional as well, like I, you said, there's an expectation of a certain standard. Okay. And then you followed on to say, sometimes I worry about what other people think. And, um, you know, obviously those two concepts are really important to me from, you know, the FOPO work that you and I talked about before this conversation started. So whose expectation and why worry about what other people think? And, and this is not, this is about you. This is not about, you know, some profundity. Like whose expectation are you concerned about? Well, the thing is we live in a social world. We don't live in a vacuum uh, within, the, within ourselves. Every, anything we do is interpreted and fed back through the lens of other people. So of course we're going to be hypervigilant to what other people think because that's our only way of knowing whether it's good enough whether we matter, whether we, we, we're loved, essentially, if you really want to get the root of it. Um, and so that's why we're hypersensitive to other people's opinions and their feedback and their validation, particularly if you're perfectionistic, because of course, remember, I talked about being a rooted in deficit. You, you, in order to feel like you matter, that you're appreciated, approved of, or loved, you need to feel that other people feel those things, that they see that you, you're worth something in this world. They're giving you approval, validation. You're, and so you're looking at all times uh, to make sure that you, you fit in, that you're okay. Um, and so other people's approval is really a prop, I suppose you could call it, for our self-esteem. It's what it, it's, it's kind of what our self-esteem is erected on. And if we receive it, great. But if we don't, then you can begin to see how that image that we're trying to project into the world gets shattered how our self-esteem starts to plummet and perfectionist people see something really curious when this happens um so instead of reflecting and, and recognizing our common humanity that we're imperfect and we make mistakes they overcompensate because they they want to make up for the mistake or setback that they've made the, the piece of critical feedback or the rejection or worse indifference that other people have shown them they want to overcompensate uh, to make sure that next time they receive the approval. So they set even higher goals, find themselves hitting setbacks and challenge more regularly because the goals are too high. And you, so begins this kind of really negative, actually, s s spiral of self-defeat where, you know, low self-esteem meets higher expectations, meets overcompensation and so on and so on. So that's the debilitating aspect of it, right? Like you set, you feel as though you're in a deficit. So you, you want the approval from other people. You want mm. to be seen as whole, as enough. Yeah. And then you set these high goals to make sure that um, you're establishing a path towards being recognized for being good enough or good. Right. right. And then you, you reach, I, I call them SOS, setbacks, obstacles, and successes. And so on that first SO piece, it's like, ah, oh, I don't know how to deal with it into this you know debilitating model that we're talking about. However, it's right at that intersection that I think that some of the most extraordinary performers like, and I'll make some people up right now because I don't personally know them, I've just studied them, Da Vinci and Michelangelo and those types of polymaths that in that setback and obstacle, they push mm -hmm. and they work through it. And what I wanna get from you is there is a facilitative part of perfectionism. It will get you better. It mm. will get you maybe really good, maybe on the world stage. I don't know a way to square joy, happiness, peace, sense of self-contentment with that approach, but you can get there. And so I'd love for you to talk about, uh, you just hit the debilitating part, but what about the facilitative part that we've seen for many high performers? Okay, Mike, that's a really, really good question. There's no doubt that perfectionism and the anxiety that goes underneath perfectionism can spur on uh, excessive amounts of um, achievement striving, which among some individuals will, will spur them in turn to, to success, right? Like to, 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 to the very top. But 
at the same time, I think we have to be really careful with extrapolating from those examples that it was the perfectionism that got them to the top and that it wasn't other factors. We know that in psychology there's something called survivorship bias. And survivorship bias is where when all we see are the winners, if all we platform are the winners, if all we listen to are the winners and we take their experiences, then we miss something crucial. And that something crucial is what was it that stopped other people making it through that selection process? And there are many factors that are crucial to success above and beyond perfectionistic tendencies and that kind of obsessive drive. Things like circumstances, meeting the right people at the right time, coming from the right background, being in the right community, being in the right country. Uh, if we're talking about athletics, having, having the right genes. There are so, so many factors that are crucial to high performance and high success beyond perfectionism. And if all we see is the people at the very top, we, we might conclude erroneously, perhaps, that it's perfectionism was the one and only thing that, that um, gave them the impetus to get to the top, when actually there were, there were factors perhaps that were more important. And what we don't see, on the other hand, is the people that are doing exactly the same things, striving in exactly the same measure, in incredible discomfort, without the Grammy or uh, CEO or uh, Olympic medal uh, to show for it. And I think if we want to understand success, we don't only have to talk to the people that made it. I think it was, it's also important that we talk to the people that didn't quite make it because their reasons for not quite making, it, I think are just as important in understanding what it takes to be successful as it is to understand why it was that people who did make himself got there. So that's, I think, the caveat here when it comes to perfectionism and extrapolating from high performers that it's a perfectionism that got there. I've no doubt that some of the perfectionism was crucial to that success. I've absolutely no doubt about that. But I think it's that perfection infused with other factors that, that um, led them to the success that they have. And if people don't have those other factors or those opportune moments, they can have the perfectionism but find that they might not make it to the top. And that's the pro that, that's where you're into the real problems because now you're doing this excessive striving, you push yourself well beyond comfort, but you're not getting the rewards. You're not, make, you're not a sailing, sailing over that bar. And that's where we see this, this, the debilitating nature of perfectionism. And I would argue there are far more people in this world that suffer perfectionism in that way than there are people who have made it to the top and at least have the accolades as compensation for that, for that excessive work effort. Yeah. I, uh, double down on exactly what you just said. And I, it's hard for me to discern um, the perfectionism and self-criticalism. And so being self-critical is certainly part of a perfectionism approach, but it doesn't have to be. It can be you know, in and of itself another conundrum or another difficult um, state of relating to yourself. So, and, uh, so let me use that same paradigm is that you're, you bump up against a setback or an obstacle and then you become self-critical. Now, so I, to your earlier point, like, is it perfectionism? Is it self-criticalism? Is what is the thing that keeps people from feeling buoyant and happy and joyful in their pursuit of fill in the blank? And so, one of the things that I—that's I, more of a commentary, I think, just me talking out loud. And I, maybe you have a point of view about that, the self-critical nature. Yeah, I do have a point of view about that. I think. Okay, great. So, so you, there's two there's two outcomes in life, right? Broadly, and you can succeed and find in the moment that you've done something well, or you can in, engage in an activity or task and fail or find that it you didn't do it quite as well as you wanted to, or you know you something happened and you weren't able to do it at all. So there's this kind of you know you've got your success and failure, and perfectionists struggle on both. Because if you succeed, the first emotion is relief. Like, oh, okay, I didn't screw up. I, I actually, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I did what's par for the course for me because I have excessively high standards that I hold myself to. I hit those standards. Thank goodness, we're going to move on to the next thing. Perfectionism, really, you know, with the, these high performers you, who are perfectionistic really find it difficult to derive lasting satisfaction from that success because there's always something more. Perfection has a nasty habit of turning our dreams into nothing more than dead ends because once we've met that task or that goal or whatever we were uh, shooting for, then we set a new floor. The better we do, the better we expect ourselves to do. So there's no room there for satisfaction from success. So even when we've done well, we can't enjoy it. 
But on the other hand, on the flip side, when we haven't done so well, that's when the problems really start to come in because not only do we have no contentment and respite on the one hand when we're successful, but now we're really critical of ourselves when we haven't done something well because we haven't hit that benchmark. That's the standard we hold ourselves to. That's the image that we're trying to project into the world of this hyper-functional, hyper-competent person that just aces all the tests, nails the presentations, goes into every athletic event, uh, with this supreme bulletproof confidence and smashes all the competition you know these are the this is the image that we hold in our mind and as soon as that shattered as soon as we hit setback failure then that's an indictment on us okay so i feel terrible about myself i've exposed to the world to other people we'll go back to that relational piece my flaws my shortcomings my deficiencies that i'm trying to disguise and so i go in and myself how could you be so stupid how could you have let that happen how why what were you thinking really self-critical so on the one hand inability to derive lasting satisfaction from success on the other hand intently self-critical uh, when we've failed so it's a it's a really difficult psychology of perfectionism because you very rarely see any joy any contentment for those two, for those two reasons it's awful i, I mean it's really it's in the end it's a badge of honor to your earlier point right like what is my one flaw in life oh i'm a perfectionist in other words signaling I'm a hard worker, grinder. You can count on me no matter what. I'll tear myself down, you know, to, to have quote unquote high performance because I'm straining. I'm sacrificing all of myself for the perfect approach or the perfect presentation. So, yeah, it's kind of like for, as you're describing that when I ask people like um, or when people say I'm a type A personality and you and I would both recognize from training that a type A personality is actually rooted in low self-esteem. And, you know, it's like, I'm type A. And it's really, do you, I mean, do you really want to wave your arms around on that? And it's the same thing. I'm a perfectionist. Oh, so of course, and I'll use some of your, your banter here is that, yeah, you're just saying that you're quite miserable, a bit boring. You're looking for relief. There's no joy in your life. Your self-criticalness is actually a core construct. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and so I say that tongue in cheek because I can recognize I can recognize that pull. I don't think that I'm a perfectionist. And I'd, I'd love if you ask me a handful of questions to discern that, but I, you know, like we all have blind spots, right? Like, I don't think I'm a perfectionist. I do have high standards. So there's a thin line there um, that I want to tease out with you. At the same time, before we go there, I want to get to a root cause. And I've got a two-step question here. Mm. Do you think that people are wanting to be perfect or present perfect? Present perfect. Present okay. Perfect. And yeah, it's not actually be perfect. No. It's not to have the, the perfect whatever. It's to be seen as perfect. Is that right? It's serenely swimming over the surface while underneath we know we're frantically paddling because we know it's tough. We know that the goals we're setting for ourselves are excessive and really challenging, but the most important thing is to appear like we're smashing it, appear like we're nailing okay. it. That's important. That's there the most you go. important. Okay, so where does this come from? And then let's get to the generational findings that you have about you know different groups of people and how they relate. But where does this come from? Well, it's okay. So there's a, first of all, let's start with the genetics because we know there's a very strong link between uh, or intergenerational transmission of uh, perfectionist tendencies, just like there is for any other personality characteristic. We know personality and the way you know the, the person we tend to end up being is heavily determined by genetics. I would say about fifty percent, just a very. Uh, back of the envelope calculation from uh, research studies perfectionism a little bit less uh 30 to 40 percent of perfectionism is estimated to be inherited but that's still a sizable amount right so if you if you've got perfectionistic parents it's highly likely you'll probably be perfectionistic yourself and there's nothing you can really do about that that's just that's just fate um however that does leave a lot for the environment to explain and when it comes to environmental factors my focus is very much on culture so we can we can talk about early life experiences and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, traumatic early life experiences abandonment things like that do have a massive impact on later life perfectionism that's not my area i'm not a clinical psychologist but there is a body of evidence there that uh, listeners can 
can can go and find if they they're interested. There's plenty of work available. My focus is really more on a broader level, at the aggregate. What's happening? Why is it that with seemingly people are becoming more perfectionistic? Because that says something about the environment today that we live in is is pushing on tendencies, uh, perfectionistic tendencies. And I've zeroed in really on uh, a few things. Social media, I think, is is an important piece of the puzzle. That, the kind of limitless images of lives and lifestyles that are perfect. We're t- certainly going to internalize those as needs to be perfect ourselves. Uh, if you look at the schooling system, it's excessively pressurized right now, um, focusing on young people to excel all the time. Uh, the workplace, you know, the hustle and grind culture, um, the uh, insecure work these days necessarily uh, pushes us to to continually work, prove ourselves, try to be something in the workplace. And parenting too, we know parenting practices have changed quite dramatically and there's a lot more expectation that parents are placing on young people. Um, and that is, is, and we've done some research to show that that's indeed linked to rising perfectionism. So there's all sorts of factors, Mike, uh, that are pl- outplaying right now, now in modern society. Um, but I think this relentless and um, intense pressure to uh, hold perfect performances, project into the world a perfect image, appearance, um, life and lifestyle. Uh, that's certainly, I think, one of the key reasons why we're seeing rise in perfections. 50% is a big number, you know, genetic uh, predisposition or coding, and you're saying it's like more 30, 40, somewhere in that range. Happiness has a similar um, component to it as well, right? Mm. 10% of your circumstances you know, up, upwards around 50% uh, genetic coding and then the remaining 40% about environmental conditions. I think I have that right. So how are you breaking those up? You're saying 50 for personality, um, genetic predispositions. And then how do you how do you square up the, the remaining 50? Well, the way in which we turn out generally, and this is a lot of classic twin studies have shown that the way in which we turn out generally is about 50% inherited. Right, so that's to say about half of the variability in between person differences in personality characteristics can be explained by their genetics. Um, now, of the rest, and there are many debates about this, so you know, don't take what I'm saying as gospel. Absolutely not. I don't take anything I'm saying as gospel. To be fair. Uh, but but, but uh, of the rest, it's my strong belief that the vast majority is learned out there in wider culture, the the, the world in which young people grew up. Okay. In. And I'm thinking and here things the behavior of um, media, right? Like uh, that surrounds them, the peer groups, um, the social and civic institutions that they're socialized into, um, the you know the parenting practices, which themselves are socialized by higher forces and pressures that are pushing on parents to behave in certain ways, right? Like all of these things are, in my, to my mind, very cultural. And that's why I've described in the book perfectionism as it's largely a cultural phenomenon. And so now let's drill into the parenting bit because a large percentage of our community are parents. And so when they heard that, I'm sure they're like, what? You know, like, okay, how can I be better? Yeah. Hopefully you're not saying, how can I be perfect as a parent, but how can I be better? Do you have any gems that, um, any insights around parenting and perfectionism? Well, first of all, just to say it's really difficult. Uh, you can start off with the best of intentions uh, and find very quickly that you're reduced to a helpless spectator, and that's fine. <laughs> that's very normal. Uh, I, you know, do I have any specific hard and fast tips or hacks? No, but I have a couple of philosophical ways of thinking that I think will help. The first is you've got to be consistent with your approval and validation. We talk, we've talked a lot about approval and validation from others as a crucial crux of the perfectionistic mindset. You have to at all times try to break through that in young people to show them that they don't have to pin their whole self-esteem on what other people think. And the way that we do that is provide consistency of approval um, and love across all, you know, all time and all events and all experiences. And what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. Well, if your kid comes in and they've got a bad grade, they're going to be disappointed, right? They're going to feel like they failed. Um, and there's going to, you know, there's going to be a frank conversation that needs to be had. The most important thing is to provide that consistency of love and approval. This grade is not an indictment on you. It doesn't say anything about how much you matter to me, your parent or your teacher or anyone else for that matter. It's just one grade out of many possible grades that you could have uh, possibly got and many possible grades that you will get going into the future and that's the most important thing and when they come home and say they got an a grade and they're really happy about it exactly the same 
What you, what's really important not to do is fall into the trap of qualified approval. As I say, when they've done well, praise them, give them raucous applause and all the rest of it. But when they haven't quite done so well, defer the praise subtly on the expectation that they continue to do more. Because what that does is it says to young people, I'm only really worth something when I've come home with an A. And when I haven't, I can tell it's not quite been met with the kind of approval or satisfaction. So that consistency of approval is so important. And and young people are very impressionable creatures. So if you have perfectionistic tendencies and you're you know, you 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 worry about mistakes and you're very, very critical on yourself and you failed, young people will pick that up. Even if you try their best to hide it, they will pick that up. So it's so, so important to have open and frank conversations with young people about your own shortcomings and your own failures. If you've gone to work and you've you screwed up a pitch, come home and tell your kids that. Tell them, you know, just had a bad day today. It didn't go well. You know, <laughs> we didn't get the we didn't get the, the, the project and this is just part of life, right? Failure is normal. It's very humanizing. It reminds us that we're imperfect and that's uh, and that's a really important uh, message uh, for young people to hear. And thirdly, and I, re- I want this to be, it's so difficult to be a parent these days because pressures on young people are so high. Yeah. Yep. So, so high. And I have so much empathy for parents because I don't think there is any choice really these days but to push subtly. You know, I, I can sit here and say, don't push your kids, you know. And it's not going to be the right message because at some level there there is a need in this in this economy in particular for your kids to to go to college, get a good degree so that they have access to the best paying jobs. Because if they don't, then they're going to find themselves falling behind. That's just the way it is right now. The middle classes are hollowing out. There is no meritocracy for policemen, uh, police officers, teachers, uh, nurses, firefighters. They're, you know, their wages have gone nowhere. They used to be solidly middle class roles. And now they're finding that uh, the living standards are declining year on year. That's certainly happening in the UK. I can't speak for the, U- uh, the US. But nevertheless, parents see this. Young people see this. They know it's so important to make sure that they get into those elite professions, which guarantee them uh, the, the best salaries and all the rest of it, which is vitally important right now in an era of, in an era of inflation and rise in the side. So, this is basically, sorry to go on, but it's so, so important that parents know that it, it's okay, that there is a lot of pressure on young people, there's a lot of pressure on them, and don't don't put yourself through the ringer. Um, this is, you're doing a great job in difficult circumstances. I hear it, and, uh, you know, I hear it. I want the best for my son. By no means am I, and I'm sure that 99% of the parenting world will recognize this, I don't want my kid to try to be perfect. That's not achievable. It's not da da da. And so I want to make sure I'm not falling into a trap that you've seen over and over again with your research is that I hear that. And then at the same time, it's like I am challenging my son to understand what it means to apply himself, to strain, to make mistakes are all part of that process. But what I'm watching is what relative to my childhood, which I know is a dangerous thing, is a bit more sedation, less agitation to want to create something that is net new, but rather to participate in something that has already been built. I'm mixing a bunch of like parts of my relationship with my son, of course, and leaving out a bunch. Most importantly at the center is like wanting to unknow him, not caring as much about what he produces in the world as much as um, he comes from a place of joy and happiness. All that being said, is like, I look at people in his generation, he's 15, I don't see like, in some respects, I think that I could build a case for the need for perfectionism. And I, I know that you're, it's like nails on a chalkboard for you probably right now, but like there's something that I'm watching in a generation where they'd rather have avocado toast and lattes, I don't know, kind of have a lifestyle of cruise control. And I don't know how we would have David by, um, Michelangelo or, you know, Moses by Michelangelo or the night watch by Rembrandt. Like, I don't know how we would get those types of beautiful, radical, which have all been noted as being imperfect masterpieces, by the way, it's one of the beauties of a true masterpiece is that, that there are imperfections in it. So I, I don't know if what I'm saying is, is hanging together because there's two parts. It's like, I'm not seeing in a generation strain and strain and wanting to create something net new and embracing the messiness of building something. And at the same time, I'm seeing like the value of imperfect masterpieces. So maybe you can grab one of those and take it. Well, 
I would say what you're seeing there is actually perfectionism. Perfectionism at its root is anti-resilience. Um, it's an inability to uh, deal healthily with setback and challenge, to overgeneralize setback and challenge as problems with us. And so that leads to a high level of reluctance sometimes to open ourselves up to the world, to take risks, to encounter situations where we may be rejected, where we may encounter failure, because the intensity of the shame, the guilt and the embarrassment that we know we'll feel in those moments because we've exposed some deficiency or shortcoming to other people and they've seen it, particularly publicly, and they've seen it and they're judging me. Remember, this is a kind of perfection. It's so intense that we withhold ourselves. Procrastination, for instance, strong correlation with perfectionism. Why? Because it's it's an anxiety management technique. The perfectionist is, is, is engaging in to try as much as they possibly can to avoid the feelings of discomfort that come from thinking that this may very well end in difficulty or setback or failure. And that's the difference between what you're seeing in the past, perhaps, where, you know, the the con the, the consequences of failure were less severe. Um, the, the, the emphasis was on the vocation. You know, I, I talk about in my book a lot about my grandfather. He was a master craftsman. He never had these hang-ups. He just wanted to leave things in the world for other people to use. Everyday things, banisters, staircases, <laughs> you know, chairs. And people still use them to this day, long after he's died, by the way. And I think that says something really interesting about his vocation, his purpose. It was really like completely different to the perfectionist, which was to try to receive other people's approval of love and fire emojis. Whereas he was just, in, you know, he didn't care about those things. No interest in those things whatsoever. He just wanted to do a good job, leave something in the world for other people to use. And when he was done, just left them there. Didn't loiter for applause or whatever but just left them there, went home and gone on with his life. And and there is a real, in, I think the intensity of the emotions that are attached to failure right now are creating exactly what you're seeing in young people is this aversion uh, to putting them, uh, to taking risks and putting themselves out there. Um, and that's why I describe it in the book, perfection is really sort of anti-resilience. So what you've identified there is maybe kids need a little bit more perfectionism. I would say actually they need less. Because, you know, the less perfection they have and the, uh, the more, let's say, conscientiousness and meticulous and diligence, this, like, you know, this a very healthy way to try and come from active, optimistic place of wanting to learn, wanting to improve, willing to take risks and fail and grow and develop. You know, that is way, way healthier. They need more of that, I think, and less of perfection. I, I, of course, I agree. You know, and I've never heard anti-perfectionism until um, your, your book on it. So, like, nice job pulling something forward, which is more uh, another dimension of resilience and a, an enabler of going for it so I, I really appreciate that how about the relationship between perfection and vulnerability do you have a point of view there yes and I'm, I'll, I'll draw from Brené Brown in, in in my discussion of this and I'll defer to her because she did most of the work in this area and, and it's very influential I'd encourage anyone that hasn't read uh, Brene's books to uh, find them and read them, Daring Greatly in particular. But they're all fantastic and they do uh, shine a light on the relationship between uh, a, a sense of not feeling good enough, this kind of rooted deficit thinking and an inability or reluctance to show ourselves or show up, as she describes it. And that's that's a real struggle for the perfectionistic person because, as I mentioned, the anticipated shame of not being recognized, not being approved of. And again, I'll go back to that feeling, but not being loved, like that's the root of this, is so intense that showing vulnerability, being courageous and just putting ourselves out there, feeling the fear and putting ourselves out there becomes really tough to the point of paralysis that we just don't move forward or move in any direction because we're just so consumed by a fear of failure. This, you know, perfectionistic people fear failure so much that they will avoid failure, as I say, they'll sabotage the chance of success to avoid failure because avoiding failure is the imperative. And that's why they find it so hard to show vulnerability and put themselves out there because it, it, there's a high chance of failure. There's a high chance of being judged. There's a high chance perhaps of being criticized or worse, ignored. You know, <laughs> social media is a classic, classic amphitheater of this. You know, we used to sign on to social media with trepidation about what we've been tagged in, you know, the embarrassing photos or whatever. This is how I used to use it. But now it's the opposite. People, young people sign on to social media and, and worry about not being recognized 
you know, not being approved of, not having mentions or comments or shares. It revealed to them this kind of, this feeling that they don't matter, that nobody appreciates mm. them. So, you know, vulnerability is, is a huge piece of this and the reluctance to be vulnerable, be courageous comes, I think, from that really rooted sense of deficit. And as I say, there are, there are scholars out there who um, have written much uh, more vividly than I, than I have just spoken about that topic just then. You know, one of the foundation questions that I ask people to wrestle with is, um, as a first principle, one of the most important decisions that you can make, are you organizing your life to avoid failure or approach success? And most people say approach success when I give them a moment to go for it, which with, with a high likelihood of failure publicly, <laughs> you know what they really do, you know what their behavior lines up with, you know, it, it, avoiding failure. So this thing is deep in us. And I love that phrase, perfection paralysis. There's a few folks that, um, that I don't know if you've come across their work. DeMar DeRozan, one of the greats in basketball, Kevin Love, one of the greats in basketball, Lewis Hamilton, Formula One, Victoria Brown, a former athlete at USC, influencers and athletes that are trying to make a difference on this narrative. It's really refreshing to see folks that are have a public sp stage and have struggled with the avoiding of failure, the struggle with like feeling like they don't have enough uh, value in like saying, okay, we gotta be done with this. So there are heroes out in the world yeah. that are waving this flag saying, you know, enough is enough. I just don't know how it's going to get done. How about this? Super small, very powerful though. Three to five phrases that you just can't wait to say to your son, you know, that to help avoid this paralysis of perfection. The first thing, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a moment because it's a really nice question, but I think the first thing we need to do is win the, win the argument because at the moment I, I don't feel like uh, the argument has been won in, in a sense. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly talking to people about this idea that you, we just need perfectionism to survive in this world. It's hyper competitive. You know, to get to the very top, you've got to be a six sigma individual. That's one in 1.4 million people. If not perfect, how are you going to get there? And to some extent they're right. But the bigger question that we should all, all be asking ourselves is actually, can we get to the same place differently? Like, are there alternative pathways to the top? And does it always have to be through self-sacrifice, uh, taking ourselves out of our comfort zone in terms of our men you know, mental and physical health, overworking all the time, pushing ourselves to the nth degree? Or can actually we find just as much performance doing things slightly differently? You know, re resting, rejuvenating feeling more vitalized in our work, which we know are very important. If you look at the data, we find, you know, perfection isn't strongly related to uh, performance. In fact, it's not related to uh, performance at all. You don't need to be perfectionistic to get to the top. You need all those outside factors that I talked about earlier. And you also need hard work. You need diligence. You need conscientiousness, a willingness to show up do the best that you can possibly do. That will just as well get you to the top as this kind of obsessive perfectionistic uh, thinking will. And, and I think that's the argument that needs to be won. That actually, you know, there, there are healthier ways to strive and they, don't, they won't preclude us from, from being an elite individual if our efforts and talents take us there. It's one of the primary missions of this podcast is to pull back the curtain on how the best in the world operate. And like, there's some first principles that are clear that perfect is not the thing, <laughs> you know, like to your point, the journey is not perfect. The, the final presentation is not perfect. And anxiety is um, unfortunately so powerful that it, it, it is one of the thieves of joy as, as the saying goes. So mastery is not perfection. And that's really what this is about, mastery of self and mastery of craft. And there are some standards, though, that we need to pay attention to. And I think that if we could just spend a moment here, because the data is clear that perfectionism positively correlated with high performance. But can you talk about an exacting high standard? Can you talk about an attention to detail and wanting to master the details? Hmm but not operating from a deficit, but coming from a place of love and joy that deep insight comes from understanding nuances and being able to artistically express whatever the craft is or the craft of self. Can you talk about some of those concepts that I just mentioned? Oh, goodness me. It's so important. 
you got to treat you got to treat what you do as a vocation. It's got to be bigger than yourself. If you pin everything that you do on yourself, then you're always going to worry about what people think. I, I go back to my grandfather because yeah, I, I always wrestled in my head when I was writing the book. Like, like why are we so different? Like we have we have this kind of meticulousness, I think, that we share, but but the way in which it's expressed is so different, and the inner dialogues that we take are so are so different. He had excessively high standards. The thing he wouldn't have been as successful as he was if he didn't have exceptionally high standards. Yeah, his summer, a lot of his wares and his wood, uh, his carpentry are in the pubs of Northamptonshire, where I come from. To this day, you know, I go in there with my father, and then we have a beautiful moment. A reflection that this is, you know, my grandfather is with us in this room right now because of the, the things that he made. You know, those are high standards. You know, they've lasted the test of time and they still look stunning to this day. But but he wasn't a perfectionist. He wasn't a perfectionist. You know, if if he if you know if he left a, a screw chip just jutting imperceptibly or he missed a bit of varnish, you know, he just let those mistakes wash through a sure sign of his, his fallibility as his wrinkles or his sciatica. You know, they weren't devastating, in other words. They weren't personal. They were just part and parcel of being a fallible human being. Being a fallible human being doesn't preclude high standards. What perfectionism is, on the other hand, is, is shame, really, embodied in a very deeply problematic relationship with ourselves and other people, whereby we're shooting for those high standards. We're trying to put those perfect things into the world for other people's love validation and approval because deep down we can't bear to show any chink or vulnerability and that is that's the crucial distinction that people have to carry with them when they're dis, when they're when they're thinking about the differentiation between perfectionism on the one hand a deep sense of deficit and high standards on the other you know you can have high standards and strive and be happy and healthy and live a very contented life and be successful it doesn't have to come come with insecurity and doubt only perfectionism graphs those two together. Brilliant. Now let's go back to like some statements. You just can't wait to hydrate with your son over time. What would be some of those things that you're really looking forward to saying or encouraging? The first one, and I think it's, this is for everyone, but certainly I would, I would be very keen to impress on my son that, that you're enough. That, you know, just existing, living, breathing, having a conversation with another human being means that you matter that you, you are enough. You don't need to justify yourself to anyone. That sheer existence is the most joyous, wonderful, incomprehensible miracle. It can only mean that we're enough. And I think that's, that's so important to impress. Secondly, I, I think one of the things that's really guided me is, um, and I would like it to guide my son too, is a sense of conviction in what he believes in, uh, finding a sense of purpose and meaning and doing it... Um, with, as I mentioned, a sense of conviction, but also compassion and making sure that as we go through the world, trying to master whatever it is that takes our interest or our passion, whatever it is he chooses to do, that he does it um, at all times with a deep sense of compassion, both for himself when things haven't gone quite so well, but also for other people too. I think, you know, it's all, I know it's very uh, airy fairy, but I think kindness is so important. It's so, 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 so important. It, it really diffuses moments of difficulty. It diffuses aggression and anger that we might feel or resentment that we might feel when we, when we think we've been wronged. And it allows us to think clearly um, about constructive ways forward, ways forward that mean that we can care for ourselves, that we can tell ourselves it's okay, that you know we, we are fallible, we are exhaustible, and that's okay, we're going to slip up. And also we can do the same to other people too. When they've encountered a difficulty or challenge, we're going to treat them in exactly the same way with that, with that kindness and, uh, and compassion. Um, so I think those mm. are the, those are the kind, I, I would say, I mean, there's a few things there that I, I think if I hold, I hold quite strongly as, as guiding values and I'd, I'd like them to be the same for my son too. I love that. So when my son was born, we went through an exercise, my wife and I, about what are the values that we want to cultivate for our son? And she wrote a page and I wrote a page and then we whittled it down and we agreed on two, which was in and of itself like, and we started with two just because we could get our arms around it as we are sleep deprived and try to figure out what, you know, how to change diapers for the first time. And so it was kindness and strength in that order. When I hear what you're just saying, I go, oh yeah, yeah, I recognize that as well. And antidote to perfectionism. Uh, kindness of self, kindness to others, and a sense of strength to be able to deal with uh, the challenges and the difficult circumstances that come 
with straining and striving and, yeah. and pursuing passions and purpose. Are you familiar with the concept wabi-sabi? I am not, Mike. Please tell me more. Yeah, so it's this... It's a concept that sees beauty in the incomplete and value in simplicity. And so like, I just feel like there's a something a, akin to the anti-perfectionism that you're talking about in this concept of wabi-sabi. Are, are you familiar with kin soji, the Japanese art of embracing imperfection? I am, I am familiar with this art, yeah. Yeah, and so it, it's a beautiful like practice. Mm. And yeah. Uh, and also fixing broken things and um, yeah, that's with with maybe gold we've got, know, yeah. as a way to make it yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. as, yeah, as right, in and exactly. of itself something that's inher that has inherent beauty in its imperfection i was toying on playing with that theme in the book it didn't end up doing it but um it's it's something that's definitely relevant to perfectionism and i think there's a lesson there in what what actually is valuable what it actually is of beauty in the world and it isn't this idealized perfect person that you're trying to impress and manage and project into the world and actually your imperfect self with all of its foibles all of its flaws and all of its imperfections is way incomprehensibly more beautiful than the perfect person that you're trying to be and i think that's i think there is a lesson there i didn't end up going with it but i think there is a lesson there. Well, that's what my wife says about my crooked nose <laughs> <laughs> And she's absolutely okay. right. <laughs> she's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, back back to your son. Three to five words or ideas for like the you know that will be an anecdote to perfectionism. Kindness, compassion. What would be a third? Well, I'll, I'll give you three C's, uh, which are linked to to what I said a moment ago. Courage to show up and be vulnerable. Conviction in your beliefs and find purpose and meaning in anything that you do and do it with conviction and compassion you know treat yourself Love and it. other people with kindness those, those are the those are the three c's those are three c's and then how will you support courage to show up and be vulnerable with your son you've got to at all times encourage 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 to push themselves out into the go world. for it you can Just do go it. For it yes yeah. i see you and yes gonna... i see you going for it i love that yeah and you're gonna yeah. suck it's all right like you know <laughs> daddy sucks a <at> guitar <laughs> but he plays it anyway because it brings joy happiness meaning and bonding right it's it's yeah. it's not about the outcome this is really important it's about the challenge. It's about trying. It's about putting one step in in front of the other and doing what you love. And if and you're gonna suck at first. You're gonna. It's not gonna be easy, and it's gonna be uncomfortable. And sometimes you you're gonna fall into the trap of perfection and try and disguise and hide and remove yourself. But at all times, it's important to remind uh, my son and anyone really that the most important thing is to try. That's the most important thing. What a great conversation. Um, Thank you for the research and introducing it to our audience and having such, you know, tender appreciation for the approach of trying to figure this thing out. Um, I, I, genuine thank you for your research in this conversation. Well, I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed um, the conversation and I hope your listeners find it interesting too. A hundred percent. And we've already, we've already driven people to um, your work. Is there a place that you would like them to go um, you know, for your book and or uh, social media? Are there specific places? Uh, I do have a website and I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. I think the easiest place for listeners is to just type in Thomas Curran, Curran spot C-W-R-A-N, uh, The Perfection Trap into Google. My book will come up, my website will come up and all the uh, leads to contact me will be available there. And I would encourage listeners, if you do pick up a copy and read it, please uh, let me know. Give me an email or, uh, or a tweet or a LinkedIn message. I love to hear from listeners. So don't be afraid. And, you know, like The Perfection Trap, I, when I read that title, I was like, ah, that's really good. And then I read the sub, t the subtitle, like Embracing the Power of Good Enough. And then I said, where did that come from? <laughs> so how did you come to that, the Embracing the Power of Good Enough? Uh, well, that was a discussion um, with uh, my editor. I, I think what we wanted to convey in the in the subtitle was, the you know, the book is is layered and it has a lot of messages but the main one really is is about landing where we can find most contentment and where we're, we're able to feel like we're achieving something moving forward but at the same time we're not pushing ourselves beyond comfort and good enough was something that kept landing on in uh, my own life something that I kept seeing in the literature around you know 
being able to let things go, move forward, let things go, move forward. This is the, you know, the crux of progress. Um, and so we landed on the concept uh, of good enough. I appreciate you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, I appreciate Thank you, you too. Thank you. Yeah. All right, bud. All the best. Take care. Thanks, Mike.